long, we'll anchor by and by. Come, we stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Oh, stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Come, we stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. My ship is on the ocean, we'll anchor by and by. My ship is on the ocean, we'll anchor by and by. Oh, stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Don't you stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Sing in hail, watch hand, tell me what makes your bow so low. Tell me, have you seen my mother? Trying to make it onto heaven's bright shore. Oh, stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll by and by, Help me stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Oh, stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Help me stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. She's made it to the kingdom, we'll anchor by and by. She's made it to the kingdom, we'll anchor by and by. Oh, stand the storm, and it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Send the storm, it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Oh, send the storm, it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Oh, send the storm, it won't be long, we'll anchor by and by. Good morning and welcome. We're virtual, but we're giving voice to the spirit together, singing a couple of songs. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me, oh my soul. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me, oh my soul. Sing with me, sing with me, sing with me, oh my soul. Sing with me, sing with me, sing with me, oh my soul. Speak for me. Speak for me, speak for me, oh my soul. Speak for me, speak for me, speak for me, oh my soul. Dance with me, dance with me, dance with me, oh my soul. Dance with me, dance with me, dance with me, oh my soul. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me, oh my soul. Comfort me, comfort me, comfort me, oh my soul. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May be whole. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be whole, 
May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be filled with loving kindness. May we be well. May we be peaceful and at ease. May we be whole. Good morning and welcome everyone to White Bear Unitarian Universalist Church. I am Annie Vale, serving on your board of directors. We are a congregation in the free faith tradition, a community of youth, adults, and children dedicated to pluralism in the spiritual search and ethics grounded in action. Our mission is to grow our souls and serve the world in love. Service participants today include Erica and Zach Fricky, Rachel Zaides, Mark King, Peg Gilfoyle, and Victoria Safford, supported by Anna Garys and Aaron Scott. Music today is from the WBUUC Choir, directed by Thaxter Cuneo, and supported by Steve Gorenson from Carol Coet and the Limbs, and from special guest, Anna Eggie, coming to us live from New York. Today, after the service at 11.15, we hope that you will join us for Cyber Social Hour. It's a fun way to meet others, see old friends, and share a little conversation in small facilitated groups. We'll put the Zoom link and easy instructions in the chat box. We're glad you're here. Welcome to our church. Come in. Come into this space which we make holy by our presence. Come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths, fears and anxieties, loves and hopes. For here you need not hide nor pretend or be anything other than who you are and who you are called to be. Come into this space where we can heal and be healed, forgive and be forgiven. Come into this space where the ordinary is sanctified, the human is celebrated, the compassionate is expected. Come into this space. Together we make it a holy space and welcome. Erica and Zach Bricky will light the chalice. This morning, while sitting around our breakfast table, our family was discussing this month's theme of memory and tracing memory and what that means to us. After breakfast, our 13-year-old daughter, Olivia, wrote these words, and we would like to share them with you. Today we light this chalice with the theme of memory. In the dark cold of winter, the light of hope glimmers. That light, that glimmer, is fueled by memory. We trace experiences to memories, storing moments of life, love, hope, and light. In the dark despair of COVID, on top of the harsh winds of winter, we hope that you will find memories of those you cherish and love to bring warmth and light into your home. Please join me for the opening words. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. We are so excited to welcome the talented singer and songwriter Anna Eggie to our service this morning. As a teenager, she apprenticed under the luthier Don Musser she built her own guitar and moved to the music mecca of Austin, Texas, where she recorded her first album, River Under the Road, in 1997 with the legendary Western swing band Asleep at the Wheel. She was named Best Singer, Songwriter, and Best Folk Artist of 1998 by the Austin Music Awards. She has toured the world and worked with several renowned producers, recording several albums. We Are One, a song she'll sing for us today, 
has gathered over 6 million spins on Spotify. Her latest album, Is It The Kiss, was released in 2019, receiving rave reviews from publications including Rolling Stone, No Depression, and Billboard. Anna happens to be the niece of WBUU members Trigva Eggy and Anne Galloway. Anna will sing a song she wrote. It's called This Time. Thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. When in the course of human events, a more perfect union makes most perfect sense. In the land of the free, oh, say, can you see? Then we will have justice and peace. Something is happening here. We all know the old roads are dead end. Over and over is over. And again will be never again. So many good people been beaten shot down but a new revolution is coming around out in the street there's a crowd gathering something is happening here we all know the old roads are dead end over and over is over and again No longer defer that our nation of laws live up to its word, and we'll hammer out history till nothing to say. Something is happening here. We all know the old roads are dead end. Over and over is over, and again. The first reading is a poem adapted from a prayer by Mark Bellatini, Unitarian Universalist. It's a response to a text in our gray hymnal, a hymn called Bring Many Names, about the many names of God. Bring many names, yes, but not all, no, not all. Keep my own name off the list for one, and keep me cautious and wincing about even saying you too often, 
as if it were a name, because human grammar is just human grammar, not ultimacy in any way, you of a thousand names and of no name at all. But bring the name of any child in Darfur, or the names of those shot in that Ohio school, and fasten them to my heart tight. Bring the names of those who beg, head lowered on golden streets, the names of those who are kept from hospital beds by policies even the devil would be ashamed to cook up. Bring the names of every flower blossoming or wilted, every wave on every lake at any time of the day. Bring the names of all who work at relinquishing the safety of their own privilege that they might face the world as it is rather than as it pretends to be crowned by glittering righteousness. Bring the names of those who are cut down by the ordinance of war or by the bullwhip of rumor or by the scimitar of innuendo so as to replace the names of fear and violence too often projected on you as your deepest name. But please bring the names struggle and trouble too and let me find you there, you who are not a you. Let the holy self name herself in the flow of tears and unfocused minds of those who grieve and bring all their million names and nicknames that we might catch a glimpse of the divine facelessness in their faces. And when all the names have been gathered, bring a prophet or two as well to sweep them all away, lest once again we lose our way in a forest of comfortable idols and convenience. And then bring new names and again and again. The second reading is adapted from Natalie Fenmore, Unitarian Universalist, from the anthology Voices from the Mar Margins, edited by Mark Morrison Reed. We are all called, called by the wind, the rushing water, the fireflies, the summer sun, called by the sidewalk, the playground, the laughing children, the streetlights, called by our appetites and gifts, our needs and challenges, called by the bottle, the needle, the powder, the pill, the game, the bet, the need, the want, the pain, the cure, the love, the hope, the dream. Called by the spirit of love and hope, we are all called. How do we choose to answer? And the third reading is from The Bond of Union, spoken at the founding of this church on November 18, 1956. As those who believe in religion, as those who believe in freedom, fellowship, and character in religion, as those who believe that the religious life means the thankful, trustful, loyal, and helpful life, and as those who believe that a church is a brotherhood of helpers, wherein it is made easier to lead such a life, we join ourselves together, name, hand, and heart, as members of White Bear Unitarian Church. Every financial gift to our congregation goes to support the programs we've come to rely on as anchors in our lives, gathering space and materials for children, youth, and families, choral rehearsals and music, classes in small groups, justice work and public witness, pastoral care, rites of passage, Sunday services, you can contribute to the offering today by sending a check or by following the easy prompt to text to give. Please note that we have changed the number you should use. The correct number appears on today's screen. Thank you for your generous support.
For so many years, we have held here to the practice, the spiritual practice of inviting members of the church to share on occasional Sundays their own journeys of faith. Several times a year, the Worship Advisory Council extends the invitation, and almost always the ones who receive it are a little startled, and sometimes they'll say, I'm no theologian. I don't know for sure what I believe or believe in. I'm not absolutely certain. My journey's not finished. I'm not really ready. And we'll say, that's perfect. That's exactly the story we need to hear. None of us is finished. We're all young on our journey, following the slender threads of ethics, spirituality, experience, relationships to people, places, the living earth, and to the holy. We're gathering threads as we go and weaving as we go some kind of story we can live in. And conviction, we're gathering conviction and enough light and love to go by. It feels always like a solitary journey, especially now in COVID time, but it never is. Our stories and theologies are intertwined, which is why these services called This I Believe are so important for all of us. And it's why we're so grateful and amazed when some of you say yes. We've kept an archive of these This I Believe presentations for many decades. And right now we're seeking volunteers to transcribe some of the old recordings and track down print text from former speakers. If you like that kind of work, please let me know. Our first speaker this morning, Mark King, was born and raised in Blacksburg, Virginia with a bachelor's in biochemistry from Virginia Tech and a master's in biochemical engineering from MIT, he has spent his career working in the biopharmaceutical industry. Mark is currently senior director of R&D at Rebiotics in Roseville. Mark met his husband, Jonathan Lubin, in Boston in 1983 and officially tied the knot on their 25th anniversary in 2008. This was in California before Proposition 8 put a temporary end to same-sex marriage there. When not socially distancing, Mark um, enjoys visiting family, traveling, and dining out. Mark King. Like most middle-class boomers, I was brought up culturally Christian. My family attended the local Methodist church where mom taught Sunday school and dad served on the church board. I was confirmed in the faith more as an exercise to make mom and dad happy than any real belief on my part. One recollection I have around those confirmation classes was asking dad about the claim that one had to accept Jesus as savior to get into heaven. I was concerned that somewhere out in the world there was a good person who never got to hear about Jesus, but despite doing all the right things wasn't going to heaven. I remember dad's reply, I'm sure God has a place in heaven for those folks. So I guess I can claim some universalist roots from my father. My journey out of the religion of my youth was influenced strongly by my coming out as gay. Most, if not all the messages telling me that I was a bad or defective person was coming from religious sources. And the messages coming from the Methodists, while not strident as some, made it clear I had no home there. As I came to claim my own self-worth, my inherent worth and dignity, and assert that I could indeed be a worthy individual, I rejected those messages and exited the mainstream religion to live an authentic life. Coming out in the late 70s and early 80s, the loud voices denouncing the idea that LGBTQ folk had any dignified role in society, much less basic civil rights, was coming from the likes of Jerry Falwell and Bernard Cardinal Law in Boston, where I was attending graduate school. At the same time, AIDS was rapidly spreading through the community. I remember talking to fellow students in the Gay Student Lounge on campus about the mysterious skin cancer that was reported in New York and speculating on how it was transmitted. As the epidemic spread, Reverend Falwell's and Cardinal Law's messages to and about people like me gained a certain I told you so nature, which seemed to permeate their religious cultures. A cousin of mine and his mother were forced to leave the church of his birth when the congregation found out he had AIDS. They fortunately found another church that would hold them through his last days and his mother beyond them. So with all these go away messages, I did. 
In retrospect, I may have taken it a bit too far. It was quite liberating emotionally standing outside the church doors and it gave me the freedom to consider what I really believed. I didn't embark on any sort of religious journey at the time. I was just happy to leave the hostility behind me. Looking back, this reinforced a pattern in my life where through college, graduate school, my early career, I was always on my way to somewhere else and I never really invested in relationships. Eventually, I found myself in a very lonely and isolated place, despite my relationship with Jonathan, good relationships with my family, and a steady job. Jonathan observed it seemed like my life involved only getting up, going to work, coming home, eating dinner, going to bed. At Jonathan suggested, I started to go to the local UU church in Gardner, Mass. He and I hadn't started living together yet. I still found myself in the on my way to somewhere else mode, and I didn't commit myself to the congregation, and I also didn't really know how to do church either. When Jonathan and I moved in together in Providence, we would attend the UU church there. We didn't devote much time to the congregation, I still didn't know how to do church, but instead we were deeply involved in the Rhode Island Alliance for Lesbian and Gay Civil Rights. Jonathan had been involved with the organization since its founding in 1983, and I began to participate with my arrival in Providence in 1991. I ended up serving on the board of the organization, including a term as president, but I really enjoyed being secretary treasurer because I got to play with developing the database and use my computer hobby to benefit the community. One of the fun projects we came up with was what we called the letter project where Jonathan and I and others would bring our quasi-portable Mac Plus computers and the laser printer to gay bars. There, we would register people to vote, get them to send letters to their state representatives urging passage of the Sexual Orientation Civil Rights Bill. After the bill passed in 1995, Jonathan and I, along with others, were present when the governor signed it into law. On a personal scale, what the Alliance provided for me was a community and friendships that deepened beyond our activism and last even till today. Jonathan and I are the non-custodial fathers to three wonderful young women, Madison, Harris, and Devlin, as a result of our meeting Malin and Diane, who co-founded the Alliance. We bought our house on Morris Avenue in Providence because Nancy Rose, another Alliance member, lived up the street, and we remain in close contact with her to today. She may even be watching. Hi, Nancy Rose. So in retrospect, what my Alliance experience taught me was how to do church. I used that experience when I moved to Pasadena in 1997 for a new job. I moved there solo for the first year to prospect the job in the area to determine whether we really wanted to relocate from Providence. When it became clear that the work culture at the company was not going to be a source for local connections, I again followed Jonathan's advice and checked out the local UU church. So this time, arriving at Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Prov Pasadena, I was prepared to do church. So when I was approached by Betsy Blue, I joined the welcoming committee and entered a new community. We used the same approach of doing church when we relocated to the Twin Cities and found White Bear UU. And we dove right into the life of the, con of the church. I remember sitting beside Deb DeBrew in one of her first visits to the church and talking about how to make and build connections. My advice to her was, join a committee. It's one of the most effective ways to get to know the church in a small group setting where you work towards a common goal, and it's work that will grow your soul. Attending services is like a stone skipping across the surface of a pond. It will give you the sense of the church, but to get to know the congregation, to belong, volunteer for a communal activity that involves working with others. I find transcendence, what I call God with a lowercase g, in two very different and opposite places. One place I find God is in what I call the spaces in between. I find these places frequently when we travel, usually to isolated and sparsely populated corners of the world with unique biomes. But my favorite place to find that space in between is in the early morning walks I take on the sandbars at Pine Point, Maine, where the open horizon, the rising sun, and the ocean breeze sweeps the weight of worldly things right off my shoulders. 
The other place I find transcendence is in community where working with others helps create a better world. I found that community in the Rhode Island Alliance for Lesbian and Civil, Gay Civil Rights. I found it in Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church. And I found it here at White Bear Unitarian Universalist Church. So what do I believe? On the sandbars of Pine Point, Maine, and touching those spaces in between, I believe I am one with the universe. Here, in community, at White Bear Unitarian Universalist Church, I believe I am one with you. Thank you so much for that, Mark. That was very moving. Thank you as an elder um, in the gay community for making the path for myself and my wife just a little bit easier. We're grateful to you. You are one with the universe. I am one with the universe. We are one. In this moment, every 
Anna, thank you so much for the gift of your music and for being with us this morning. We are so glad that you're part of our service. Our second speaker, Rachel Zaides, began to attend WBUUC roughly three years ago with her husband, Evan, and two children, Juniper and Leo. Rachel was born in Austin, Texas, and eventually moved to Minnesota to attend the College of Visual Arts in St. Paul, where she studied traditional illustration and printmaking. She continues to create, primarily working with pen and ink, with mixed media and fiber arts. During the pandemic, she's been focused on spinning, knitting, and more recently, weaving. Rachel spends a great deal of time foraging, camping, and chasing the aurora borealis. She also enjoys reading, cooking, playing board games with her family. As an artist, Rachel believes it's important to seek out moments of awe in everything and use those feelings of inspiration to create art that will affect others. Rachel Seides. When I think of the word God, the way that I feel when I listen to stirring music comes to mind, or the awe that I feel when I walk in the woods, the love I have for my children. When I think of the word God, the childlike fascination I experience every time I learn something new comes to mind. The excitement for knowledge yet to be obtained, the unknowing and the mystery, the feeling when I create something with my hands, when I put something beautiful into the world, the feeling of being in community, and what happens when an individual or group of individuals work together to do something important. The feeling of sitting in a room with others and just being. To me, God is everything. God is the connection between things, the cycles we see in people, in the planet, in the universe. And there's this great mysticism that we as humans all tap into, like an underground river that we all access through the various moments and experiences that stir us. White Bear UU became a fresh wellspring for me, a new point of access, another way to tap into God. And I don't often use the word God, but for the purposes of this story, my story, it works. I knew when I walked into the building for the first time that there was something for me in that place. The natural light, the beautiful art. I remember stepping into the sanctuary and looking at the trees through those windows and thinking, yes, I can feel that river under my feet. But commitment to a community has to go beyond that for me. I can find God in the woods, in my morning cup of coffee, in a conversation or a radical act of justice. I only need to be paying attention. So I was pleasantly surprised to open the sanctuary doors and hear a call to action. My first Sunday visiting, Victoria was speaking about trans rights and expressing a call for inclusion through the community. I was taught by my father to always walk in with questions. And to be clear, I don't mean criticisms, questions for the sake of knowledge, understanding, and growth. One of the biggest for me walking into a new church was, will this community not just bind me together with a diverse group of individuals that share uh, certain crucial beliefs, but also stir in me the drive to go beyond what I'm already doing, to not become complacent, too settled, to not live in a belief that there's nothing more to be uncovered, to continue to see my privilege and use it appropriately without doing harm, to lift up others, to always be healing. Wow, that's a lot to ask of a church and a lot to ask of myself. But I knew that White Bear had the potential to help with those journeys. This is not the first Unitarian Universalist church that I've called home. In addition to trying several uh, others in the Twin Cities, I attended a UU youth group in high school. My father is a Methodist minister, and he was often the guest speaker at a nearby UU church. I had other friends who attended there, and my father encouraged me, as he always did, to experience something new. So I did. And while the very reasonable sermons appealed to me, I quickly realized that I was no longer tapping into my spirituality at that particular church. So I went back to the Methodist community that raised me, a small congregation known as Trinity Church of Austin, a place that my father had been appointed to in the mid 80s. He's still there and will be retiring next summer. For any of you familiar with the operations at a Methodist church, you might be wondering how a Methodist pastor could end up in one congregation for 33 years. The answer is that my father made good trouble. He spent his career making good trouble, knowing as he put it, that his children were watching him. And we were. He also knew that his bishop would not be willing to risk moving him to potentially 
corrupt another congregation, which is why I was fortunate enough to grow up with many of the same loving church members, instilling in me a gratitude for community that still beckons me back from the woods and into the church today. My father, the man that was my example of integrity growing up, was a person who spoke out, a person who marched, a person who risked his career and many times uh, risked his life to make a space for those in the world who had none. He took a small dying Methodist church and compassionately helped it to evolve into the first reconciling congregation in Austin, Texas. And by the time I was in junior high school, I fully understood why he had to be the person to speak out and get arrested and take risks because he had the privilege to do so. And he had a belief that as a Christian, he was called to follow in the example of the man Jesus and fight for those on the margins. As he says, the mythology he chooses to follow is one of resurrection, of new beginnings, of radical change. I grew up in a church with drum circles, Wiccan priestesses, a food pantry, and eventually a fully functional fully functional homeless shelter. I grew up in a church with my silly singing, rainbow flag wearing, good trouble making activist dad and a large number of members from the LGBTQIA plus community. And I know I took this for granted when I was younger. When I had a Wiccan slash Christian hybrid confirmation ceremony in a Methodist church at age 12, because the, the code harm none but do what thou wilt felt in line with my beliefs above all else, I definitely took that for granted. Also being surrounded by a rainbow of individuals in a faith community that celebrated them in the early 90s, I know I took that for granted, especially when I eventually came out to my parents and did so with very little fear because the example I had been given was of love and celebration. That example also gave me the strength to look past my mother leaving and the difficulties that it created in our home so that I could feel joy for her, knowing that she had finally found the courage to come out to my father as a lesbian and find a love that made her whole for the first time in her life. Needless to say, my adult search for a new community has been challenging. I knew what I was looking for, and I was no longer taking for granted the importance of the unique community I'd grown up in, especially knowing that I wanted my own children to have what I had had. When I sit inside of our sanctuary, I feel community. I feel good trouble being stirred. I see growth and pain. I see moments of peace. I see my kids playing. I see new friends that I love dearly. Uh, I hear for the beauty of the earth echoed in the congregation's love of this planet and in the sermons our ministers give to us. I feel the trees and the cups of coffee and the reach we have into our neighborhood community, our city, state, country, and planet. I feel hope and clarity when I experience all of this. Thank you. Rachel, thank you. <laughs> And Mark, thank you. You have both told us some things, reminded us of the saving power of churches, the healing power of community, congregational community, of knowing that you're truly known and seen and beloved, that we all are as we are. You both spoke of the congregations of your childhood, both as houses of hope, homes to justice and liberation theologies, and you told us other stories of hurtful churches steeped in fear and hell-bent on exclusion. And each of you then in different ways spoke of how theologies of love can save us and thereby save our world. You both talked about the sacred as the space in between, between us, among us, and between each one of us and the natural, beautiful world. You brought us home today. Thank you. Let's join together in a spirit of meditation and a spirit of prayer. Spirit of life. On this glad morning, beautiful snowy morning, we are grateful to those among us who are brave enough and generous enough to offer nothing but their truth, nothing but their stories as holy gifts to us so that we might all make some kind of meaning we have some kind of wisdom from these days that sometimes feel so random and disordered. We're grateful to Rachel and to Mark and to Olivia and her parents in the chalice lighting for teaching us this practice of noticing our lives and gathering the strands to make a living story. We're grateful to Anna, Carol, Baxter, and the choir for doing this same work through music. 
This morning, we give thanks for good companions on our journey, for even though we're apart, we know we're not alone. Our family, our church family, is right here. Breathing in, may there be peace. Breathing out, may there be love. This morning, we hold in prayers for healing all those who are sick in body, spirit, and mind, those living with physical or mental illness, with addiction, depression, loneliness, as the pandemic and the winter drag along. We hold those who mourn. May there be peace. May we ourselves be healing balm to one another. And like Rachel's dad, may we rededicate ourselves to stirring up good trouble. May we stand convicted of aiding and abetting every day acts of love and justice. Into the silence now and out of it, I invite you to speak aloud or whisper or just hold silently the names of those you love and know that we're holding them with you strong in hope. For just a moment, we'll be silent. Amen. Our closing hymn is I Know I Can. Carol's going to lead us one more time. peace dwell within our hearts and understanding in our minds. May courage steal our will and love of truth forever guide us. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Thanks especially to our speakers, Rachel and Mark, our reader Peg, our musicians, Carol Thaxter, the limbs who you'll hear in a minute, and our special guest today, Anna Eggie. 
and for everyone behind the scenes, especially Anna, Aaron, and Steve Gorenson. If you're visiting or new today, welcome. All of you are welcome to join the Cyber Social Hour at 11.15. You'll see a link in the chat. Call to ask for help or offer help. We're sending love to all of you from 328 Maple Street and all of our locations. Stay well, everyone. Amen. Gotta keep on singing as long as I'm believing in the world it can never hold me down and it doesn't matter what they're saying fear is what Before the dark, hope like a sea.